Hi everyone, I'm Josh and this presentation will focus on domestication and foreignization as used in Lawrence Venuti's book, The Translator's Invisibility. You probably have an idea of the difference between the two strategies at this point, so my focus on Venuti's book with its polemic conception of this dichotomy will let us view it from a new perspective. First, I will outline the book for context and then give my arguments for and against Venuti's concept. Chapter 1 links domesticating or fluent translations, which, Venuti argues, hide their status as translations and give the illusion of authorial presence with the invisibility and problematic work conditions of translators themselves. I've included two passages for you that highlight Venuti's view of domestication and his ultimate aim. In Chapter 2, Venuti dates the Anglo-American preference for fluent translations to 17th century England, particularly to royalists like John Denham, who translated classical works in a way to promote the royalist worldview, following the tumultuous English Civil War. He then sketches the persistence of fluent translation in the 18th and 19th centuries, comparing John Knott's largely forgotten, foreignizing, and sexually frank Catullus translations with George Lamb's well-received, bowdlerized, and domesticating ones. In Chapter 3, Venuti discusses Schleiermacher's intention to use foreignizing translation to elevate German letters and culture, and thereby to facilitate Germany's cultural dominance of Europe. Despite this agenda, so different from Venuti's, he nevertheless sees Schleiermacher's theory as providing translators, quote, a way out, unquote. Then, he explores Francis Newman's foreignizing translation of the Iliad with its Old English ballad form, archaic diction, and close adherence to the Greek syntax, and line breaks. Contemporary cultural critics like Matthew Arnold savaged his non-elitist, target text-based approach to Homer. I leave you with Venuti's quote on close translation as foreignization. Chapter 4 is about Eugenio's, Ugo, Tarchetti's uncredited translation of Mary Shelley's gothic tale, The Mortal Immortal. Despite its largely domesticating style, Venuti argues here that choosing a text can be foreignizing in itself. Tarchetti, he says, foreignized uh, by writing Gothic novels when Italian literature was overwhelmingly realist. I leave you Venuti's quote about text choice as a potentially foreignizing act. Chapter 5 deals with experimental modernist translation in the 20th century by Ezra Pound, Celia and Louis Zukovsky, and Paul Blackburn, Pound's most devoted disciple. Venuti explains how such unconventional translations remained marginal, even with the mid-century surge in translations into English, particularly of Latin American literature. Chapter 6 revolves around the concept of simpatico, introduced to Venuti by an older translator he respected. Simpatico is the idea that a translator should feel a special identification with his or her source author, particularly one of the same age, in order for the translator to grow with him or her. <coughs> Excuse me. Venuti encountered something like this with his lifelong translations of Milo de Angelis. Nevertheless, Venuti comes to criticize simpatico as cultural narcissism that seeks the familiar in reading or misreading foreign literature. Chapter 7 is Venuti's call to action, where he exhorts translators to challenge prevailing norms of fluency, cultural, legal, and economic codes that marginalize and exploit translators, and the romantic idea of authorship that labels translators as second-class authors. With this needed context, 
I'll now explain the merits and weaknesses I observe um, in Venuti. The first merit I see is that the concept elicits critical reflection about translating. Venuti's deliberately polarizing tone forces translators to consider the implications of their method with regard to foreignizing and domesticating in a way that only such a contentious text can. I also see it as promoting a more intelligent use of domestication, as its forceful break with conventional wisdom of what makes translations good gives proponents of domestication a greater impetus to defend their position intellectually instead of taking it for granted. Finally, it seeks to legitimize more diverse ways of translating. For instance, I'm interested in translating 19th century Spanish novels with an archaizing strategy. Since a 19th century Spanish novel will feel slightly antiquated to modern Spanish speakers, it makes sense to me to attempt to recreate this temporal distancing for target text readers as well. A weakness I see in Venuti's concept is that, for lack of a qualifying statement to the contrary, he implies that a foreignizing strategy should be applied universally, at least in literary translation. I find this to be an overly limiting position, especially with Venuti's seeming awareness that different texts require different approaches. Also, he assumes a nearly exact correspondence between Anglo-American ethnocentric domination and fluent translation. This, however, ignores that fluent translation is favored in other cultures that don't have such international sway, as Jeremy Munday notes in citing Anthony Pym. <clears throat> Additionally, Robert Bjork, a reviewer of Venuti's book, points out that fluent translation in English began not in the colonially ambitious 17th century, but rather in the 9th century, a time when the English were not politically dominant, as shown by the Viking and Norman invasions that would follow in the two centuries to come. Likewise, Venuti's mention of Schleiermacher's nationalistic use of foreignization further calls into doubt the notion that a strategy is inherently tied to a specific ideology. Lastly, some techniques Venuti praises as foreignizing seem to do something quite different. For example, he lauds Blackburn's 1950s slang in his medieval Provençal translations. And, as Monday notes, Venuti himself uses modern slang alongside archaism to translate Tarchetti's 1860s Gothic tales. This appears to be adding difference that is not there, instead of signaling existing source culture difference. Since Venuti rightly criticizes Robert Graves' translations from Latin for their anachronistic presence of 1950s homophobia, Venuti's praise and own use of anachronism elsewhere seems inconsistent. Perhaps this true dichotomy is accommodation versus alienation. In conclusion, Venuti's take on domesticating versus foreignizing translation can be a great tool for translators to reflect on their choices and think outside the box in the act of translation. However, a more nuanced assessment of the relation between translation strategies and specific ideologies is in order. My views on the foreignization versus domestication dichotomy itself can be summed up well by the two quotes here from the late Michael H. Heim. Thank you so much for listening to and watching my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, I leave you with my bibliography. Thanks again.